right. Welcome, everyone, to 22 Minutes in Lending. I'm your host, Vince Passione. I'm happy to introduce Brian Cray, Senior Vice President of Credit Card and Education Lending at Navy Federal Credit Union. Brian has spent the last 15 years at Navy Federal, previously heading up all the collections technology and risk, a topic I certainly hope we get to touch on during this podcast. It's a pleasure to welcome Brian on today's show. So let's get started with this 22 Minutes in Lending. Brian, welcome. Uh, well, I'm happy to be here. I'm, I'm excited to chat about some ed loans and credit cards. Yeah. That's great. Well, first off, belated congratulations. Uh, this past July, I know you welcomed uh, U.S. Navy Seaman Braden Galvin as a 13th millionth member. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm surprised. A surprise, I'm sure he's never going to forget. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I also believe it's Navy's 90th year of service, which is pretty fascinating because Navy is not just any credit, right? This is the largest financial cooperative in the world, which putting in perspective for our listeners, right? Size and scale, right? So we're talking about 13 million members, right? $165 billion in assets. And there's also a big growth story. The deposits are up about almost 7%. Membership is up almost 10%. Uh, loans are up 15% year over year. Credit card balance is $27 billion, which I was looking at the recent quarterly call reports. And that I think that's almost a quarter of all balances across the entire credit union industry, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, wow. Did not know that. But um, yeah, but just to correct you, I'm going to pull it up, but I think we're 28 now. Ah, there we go. And then uh, student loan portfolio balances today about a billion dollars. Uh, so, so really huge. So not just any credit union, right? The largest financial cooperative. So Brian, so Navy Federal began originating education loans back in 2015. That's how, you know, we, we certainly met. And since that time, you originated over $2 billion of them. So what kind of education loans are you currently originating? Uh, so we offer in-school refinance, uh, both fixed and variable rate products. And terms are five to 15 years, but I believe uh, 15 years is just for the refis, five to 10 for the end school. So Brian, how about we talk a little bit about why education lending, right? This is a big contested pro product. When we talk to different financial institutions, why to offer it, there was a very specific thesis at Navy. Can you talk to our listeners about why? Well, I mean, Navy Federal in general, uh, listen, we're here to serve our member needs. Um, and we know with the rising uh, tuition and federal coverage not meeting that rising tuition, there was need. There was need out there. And our members that wanted to invest in themselves, uh, you know, grow their knowledge, um, they didn't have that opportunity and we wanted to offer it to them. So so it, it, seemed, it seemed like a good fit um, back to serving our member needs. Now it is a it is a product. Now I remember back in the day, right? That when you looked at it, this was a product that could help you get multi generational. It was part of the thesis. Have you gone back to test the thesis, and what are you finding? Uh, well, it definitely skews younger, is what you're saying, and and it's one of the entry level products, right? The ones that that can bring our members into uh, into Navy Federal and engage with them in a deeper way. We have found, and and we're doing actually, uh, it's funny that you mentioned that, we're doing a more in-depth analysis uh, as we speak, uh, but it's something that we revisit from time to time. But we do find that there's greater product penetration in, in our other traditional products as somebody comes in to the edu educational lending um, entry into maybe so. Now, when we look, and I remember when we first started, but the average age of your typical credit union member is about 53. Navy skews much younger, so about 38, I think. Is that right? Uh, so we definitely skew younger. I don't know. I don't know the exact number, but we we skew younger. We have for for quite a while. Yes. Now, now, how much do you, do you think some of that's tied to education lending? Is there some some cause and effect, or we don't know yet? So, well, it's funny. I, I think they're tied together, um, but I think kind of the direction of it is, like I mentioned, we have skewed younger for quite some time, and I think it originates from kind of the active duty membership base and the enlistees, right, which, which are going to skew younger as is, right? But that's what made it such a natural fit to bring education lending into our lending product suite, uh, because we do skew younger, and this is, this is 
what our members need in that in that stage of their life cycle. So I, I, they're directly connected, but I don't I don't I think it was really the military base that really brought that skewing younger. And and Brian, remind me, but I believe when we started, we started with both in school and refi both at the same time, right? They, and and the need was there for for both the in school product and the refinance product, and still seeing strong need. Is that right for the refinance product? Oh yeah, yeah. We've uh, well, and in fact, in the in the refinance space, uh, we've had a couple of very strong ones as as these payments uh, start back up from federal loans in the last couple of months. You know, it's prompting members to really revisit their situation and and realize that they have an opportunity to. They were on the sidelines waiting for a lot of the administration stuff to kind of work its way through. And now that it has and we paid it through started, we had some, uh, some strong months in refinance. Yeah. So speaking of that, right? So we've all been anticipating this, lots of press about it, all the economists warning about these big seismic repercussions about consumer finances and the impact it's going to have. So I want to talk to us a little bit about what did you do to prepare your members for? this repayment uh, continuation? Yeah, it, I mean, it was, it was, it was, there was a lot of discussion about it. And it was our radar for a long time. Um, so a couple of things, uh, but the overall goal was to educate our members so that they understood the options they have both through federal programs as well as with us. Uh, so reaching out over email channels, um, having resources available online, like making sense and, and some FAQs. And we distributed FAQs to our frontline, you know, contact center and branch so that they were able to uh, appropriately inform the member of their options if they were to walk into a branch or, or pick up a phone. So it was on our minds for a long time. And, and actually, I'm going to comment on like the, the narrative um, about the seismic kind of impact on it. We took a look at it. Um, as I said, it was it was constantly discussed and it was on our mind. We took a look at our membership and found the position that we're in and and those that were going to be impacted by this. And when you really looked at kind of the DTI income situation, these members, their credit positions, the exposure wasn't quite as bad as as you would see in articles. But I think that's typical of anything, right? That a lot of the headlines like to kind of um you know, exaggerate maybe a little bit, but, but yeah. Well, we also, so look, the average payment was about, I think it's 300 and, and $380 or $350, right? Is the average payment on that federal loan that was going, was going to start, start kicking in again. So as you said, right, if you start looking at your customers, your members and think about their DTI and their debt burdens and understanding their capacity, and now they're going to have to start making this payment again, right? You know, if they have the capacity, I think, and I, I obviously intimate in the research, you can understand, yeah, right, not as bad, right? Um, and and also, uh, the, uh, uh, there's so many federal programs now for these folks to get forgiveness. Um, we've seen probably about 20 billion of it actually been given already. Yeah, I was, uh, yeah, I was looking at, I'm curious, the updated numbers. I know um, that that SAVE program was very generous. The the updates to it, the eligibility criteria, kind of the, you know, zero payment in certain circumstances. And the, um, I saw 4 million, I think it's up to five and a half. Five um, and a half. Yeah. So, yeah, and that's certainly helping, right? Uh, for sure. Yeah, I think I think the, the, the change to the SAVE program, the application process, and then there's a bunch of different tools, I think, that are out there today, like this pay it off that we just launched, that I think will definitely help as consumers try to find these kind of programs. So early days, no yet, no red flags yet. It's only been about, it's only been about a month yet, but no red flags yet, I'm assuming. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So uh, again, um, we're very conscious of it. So I actually just had a conversation with my peer in collections because a lot of the early indications are what are these, uh, these counselors hearing on the phone in terms of members struggling and what are they saying? And we're not hearing much of it. Um, and it's not, it's not coming through as of yet, but I, I do credit it, as you mentioned, to some of the federal programs um, and, and the fact that our exposure isn't quite as, as uh, elevated as you would think. Now, we talked about upsell, cross-sell. 
And, and certainly look, that's the Holy grail, right? When we think about, you know, going out there and selling a product like this, especially early in the life cycle of this particular member, what are some of the strategies about upsell, cross sell when you, we are getting someone who's obviously they're going to school They're this is probably one of the first products they get right. When we think about in their financial lives, strategies that Navy's deploying today for upsell, cross sell for this particular member. Interesting. Um, so. Upsell, cross sell, obviously, let me just let's speak to it at a high level from the Navy fellow perspective, right? Um, we very much look at it more from the unique individual member's need, right? Um, it, is an, it is a kind of a, a very rigid program of, you know, they have this product, let's give them this product. It, it is more trying to... And, you know, Mary says this all the time, our, our CEO, uh, you know, know me, show me, do it for me. So it's really, we want to understand the, the unique member situation and get that product that fits with them. Um, because getting the right product is the one that's ultimately going to engage them with and keep them coming back to us. Um, but, I, I mean, if you think about it, some of the younger folks and, and the progression, the typical progression to the life cycle, uh, we're we're going from, you know, let's say Ed loan, it's a credit card, then auto, then then uh, home loan, right? Um, and that that seems to be delaying more and more these days. Um, so uh, we're mindful of it, and and the thing we're focusing on very particularly with Ed loans, quite honestly, right now is we like we're looking at the serialization, right? We want to retain that member through that entirety of college. And we're focused on retaining them through all their years in college and, and, and then getting that refinanced after. Right? Um, uh, so that is a lot of our focus, but there are small things around the edges that, that we're doing to, to look at credit cards and auto, I would say. Yeah, it makes sense. So as you think forward, challenges, opportunities, obviously we look at tuition, right? Inflation and tuition go hand in hand, right? These schools are they're, they've got labor costs. They are running a hospitality business. Cost of tuition is back back on the rise again. It was sort of flattening out a bit, it, and it was coming down a bit, but now it's way back up again. I think this year we'll see it's probably back up to that year over year, five, five, five to five and a half percent increase. So it's not coming down. It's going to start escalating. But as you think going forward, as you, and, and advice to credit unions for providing education loans, challenges, opportunities, last, last point on this topic. Yeah. Um, so uh, to break it into two, right? So uh, refinance, right? You're gonna have some challenges with rising rate environment and and some of those things. But actually, it's it's interesting that we discussed uh, when you were here for a past quarterly some of those variable rate uh, books of business from in school that might be coming uh, that might be coming due, where the adjustments were so elevated through that time of rising rates um, that there might be some opportunity out there for refi. But really, the end school, I think, is what you're talking about. Um, the challenges, you, you lay them out, right? And and the one thing I don't think you touched on is um, enrollment, right? Enrollment continues to drop uh, for end school. But I think to flip that and the opportunity, what we have seen is some of these kind of purpose-built programs and certifications for, for different things, uh, on the rise, right? Um, and I think it's a reaction to some of the rising tuition costs you talk about in, in some of these times. So um, we're starting to look at that. We want to see if there's some opportunity and, and if there is really member demand and that's what their need is and, and see if there's places we can go in that space. No, it makes, it makes a lot of sense, right? You, you know, the, a lot of these certificate schools, especially when we look on the tech side, makes an awful lot of sense in this environment. And, and certainly we have, we have discussed it. No, great, great. Let's move on to credit cards. So, so not 27 billion, 28 billion in outstanding credit cards. So I appreciate the, uh, the correction. And a lot of credit unions only have sort of one credit card offering, maybe two, but they're typically A plus paper, but that's not the way you, Navy does it, right? You kind of go across the entire sort of spectrum. Is, is that right? Yeah, that, that is right. And, and I think, uh, you know, you're going to hear probably a few themes um, kind of weave throughout all of these questions in the conversation, but it, it always comes back to the memory, right? So 
I think we are lucky when you compare it to other credit unions. We, we are lucky with our size, our reserves, our capital to be able to handle a lot of this. But we see, you know, we skew younger, right? So, uh, you know, credit access is a big thing for younger folks as they're starting out. So we have a whole suite to, to kind of serve our members' needs as they kind of go through their life cycles. We early credit building, credit access, you know, middle, maybe you're getting into a no fee cash card, and then towards the end where maybe it's an annual fee travel card. So we have we have a full suite we believe can serve our members' needs throughout their lunch cycles. So so when you think about the 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 leading with the card and given the the global nature of your client base it really is about access isn't it when you think about the strategy as i hear you talk about it right i mean it makes sense right that this is a product that for your particular member right this is the right lead product am i am i paraphrasing correctly no 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 that's right and and it's back to that beginning part about about our specific member needs it's because of our member and that global access that is for sure the case and and a lot of these product designs um are built with that in mind for things like no foreign transaction fees for some of our military folks that are overseas. Um, so that that certainly is is a large part of it. Yeah. So then 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 what's the process then? So you start with let's say that entry level, and then how do you deepen the relationship? Um, so a lot of the entry level, we're gonna you know gonna pick one channel, right? Um, we have a credibility part. That is to really start them on their journey. Now, a lot of the pieces around the credit building part are education, how to manage that debt responsibly, right? And and we grow their their unsecured access within that card over time as they demonstrate and grow and manage their debt responsibly. At that point, we have strategies in which um, we see them kind of their spend behaviors, their life cycle, and so on. Uh, transitioning and we'll be proactive with a separate unsecured card with maybe a higher line that's a two percent cash back so we can up the, the rewards that they get uh grow some of their access to credit and then it goes beyond that right as we talked like auto home loan um but it's all geared around knowing our member and what is right for them right and we we're not just in this stock just like you know, going back to the, the Wells thing, like eight products, right? Shove eight, eight products. No, it is what fits for them in their life cycle. I mean, so now major announcement, right? PSCU and co-op came together. What's the impact of the industry of all that? I mean, obviously they've outsourced a whole bunch of work, right? For credit unions, especially smarter credit unions that don't have the scale to do what Navy does. So, and it makes sense, right? Given the industry and the size of the industry, there's been some consolidation. So it makes some sense for them to consolidate a bit. But what's the broad implication of the industry? And then is there any implication in Navy? So it's interesting. Um, you know, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, right? Because I think you referenced it, right? It's It's something that I am not as intelligent about because... We do, we're very fortunate to have the size scale reserves to do a lot of this, well, all of it ourselves, right? But from what I understand, you know, the mergers could just grow the scale and coverage of the services available, which ultimately makes the product a better product that our big credit means that utilize the services can offer, right? Um, so, I assume that it is a very, a very positive for credit unions of smaller scale that that one off the card. The only thing that I, I and this is back to you, Tori, your thoughts, is I don't know the risk management kind of piece of that, right? Because that's a big piece of credit card, especially for a small credit union that can't maybe doesn't have that big reserve pile to to handle unexpected losses. Look, I, I think these two organizations have stellar reputations. I think putting them together is just a recognition that it's a sign of the times, right? The cost of technology, especially this next stage of technology, when we think about AI platforms and what it's going to take to deploy them and train models, I think of what's happening in payments and real-time payments and the rails that are going to be need to put in place to do that all require, right? 
some new tech stacks and new innovation. And I think putting these companies together give them the capacity to continue to innovate because they've been innovating from the time they started, right? They, you know, this sense of, co of, of creating a cooperative that can deliver real value across any size credit union is what they were founded on. I think now that there's been consolidation in the industry from the credit union perspective, it makes a little sense in the world that they came together. Uh, but also, given what's happening in technology and this next big turn, it made sense that, that they, they're doing what they're doing for all the reasons you talk about, right? Because you've got to get to that next level of managing risk. And let's face it, right? The tech is getting, getting much more sophisticated, and that means also the bad guys have access to that, right? Um, so, you know, and, and certainly listening to some of, of the discussions from the folks involved, I think that was a lot, a, a lot of it. It, 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 it's, it's getting that critical mass so they can make the necessary investments to keep innovating. And I think overall it's good for the industry. Yeah. 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 And that's fair. And, and a hundred percent, uh, we, you know, the startup capital and the investment for all the technology that's required by now. Yeah. All the sense of the world, right? So, so Navy Federal, about a third of the nation, about 30% is eligible to join Navy Federal, but over two thirds of consumers already have a credit card. And I think I got all those sort of percentages right. So how does that affect the way you thread the needle and you think about credit card growth and you know, how you think about the market? Is it saturated? Where do, you, where do you market? What's next? Where do you get your growth from? Yeah, yeah, um, a good question. And, and you know, the numbers, Quite honestly, I don't know, but I mean, I think with the expansion of veterans, which has been pretty recent for us. Big expansion, right? Yeah, that, and that was, I think, what really grew, um, I'm not too sure of the percentage, but it really grew our eligibility throughout the, the population. Um, and, and I think that's the first part of my answer right there. There are some newer expanded field of membership um, spots where we, we're not penetrating as much as we want. Now, to your point, I think in, in terms of how many people have a card, right, um, and how it's how it's whether it's saturated or not, some of those veterans are older, right, and they probably already have an established PFI and and maybe a credit card, so more it's more of a switch, right, um, play or a multi card play, and I, I think that'll be the other answer is that we are seeing a larger trend of uh, you know our members but larger customers. Uh, having more cards in their wallet, right? Um, so that has been encouraging. We're evaluating that, whether or not we want to double down on that strategy, but we're evaluating that because it comes with some risks. Um, and the last part, which is interesting, which I just heard, was some of the younger generations, um, specifically Gen Z as compared to millennials, they are getting their first card product earlier than prior generations at the same time. Um, so I, I think there's opportunity there's there's opportunity out there for sure amongst some of those pockets of our membership base in particular. So you touched on that and that's a big step, right? The credit card debts increase, I think it's by more than 16% uh through the year ending the Q2. And there's a lot being written that this is the younger consumer. Now it also can just be demographically, right? That's what we, we can expect because they're becoming a larger portion of the workforce. But is that right? Is that what's happening? Or should we be concerned about this growth? It's funny. Um, this is similar to the answer I gave before about kind of a tag headline. You know, people. But if you actually look at the credit card debt over a longer timeline, and there was a, there was a large drawdown during the pandemic for, for obvious reasons, um, and the acceleration has been rapid, but if you draw a line from the prior time frame before pre-pandemic, we're right about at that that linear progression of what credit card debt was rising. So while it has been rapid over the past year, it's really falling in line with the longer-term trend, right? And in terms of the younger generation um, and how much they're a driver of that. I do believe it is a bit more demographics, right? We are seeing more strength among the Gen Z and some of our purchase uh, behaviors uh, amongst our portfolio. 
but it's a lot of them entering the workforce. They're get their increased earning power. Um, and it's just more of a demographic than, than anything else that I'm seeing right now. Makes sense. So collections, you spent a lot of time in collections when I first met you, right? Um, you were managing collections of risk. Um, and, and you have a very specific philosophy, and I think it's the Navy philosophy, right? This is, this is managing, this is a member, right? You're, you're helping them with a solution. This is a, a point in time. But let's talk about the different ways that you think about collections, right? So Brian, so does FICO play a role in how collections are actually managed? So um, FICO plays a role, uh, and, and there are many attributes about a member that play a role in how we manage the collection of, of a debt. But more importantly, all of these attributes are just a, a picture of a member and understanding how to work with them. And, and, and one of those opportunities, we, we have this uh, division, which is called personal financial management, and, and it's unique. I believe to to credit unions, I think it, as a whole, certainly in every federal. Um, and what it is is that it's going beyond just FICO and some of those attributes. It's actually sitting down and talking to you about your holistic situation, not just your credit card debt, because because an account doesn't go bad, a member is struggling, right? So let's talk to that member, understand the whole picture of what's going on, and then we can work with all of the individual accounts that that we have with the Navy Federal to understand the best way that, that we're not just gonna kick the can, we're gonna put you on a path to, to become more financially secure by looking at you as a whole member. Right, yeah, look, they're a member for life, right? So yeah. this, is a, this is a stumble along the way. Yeah, and we want to help get back on their feet, yep. Mm -hmm. Exactly, no, it makes a lot of sense, Brian. And, and do, you, do you see AI playing a role in this? Or do you feel like, it becomes like, like certainly some of the things that we've seen in our business, in, in our shops is uh, consumers react in some cases better to, oh, SMS, it's, it's, it gives me a little more privacy. I can make a decision very quickly if I want to make a payment. Some, are you seeing things similar, Brian, or not? Yeah, so it's interesting. So um, I've been in cards and envelopes for about three years now. Uh, prior to that, as you were talking about, I was with collections for about five or six years. Very early on, and I, I point that out to say it's nearly eight years ago, I was looking at an AI solution for text messaging. Um, but it was overseas because, you know, there's 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 a lot more regulatory hurdles and concerns about stuff like that in the United States. But their solution was ingenious, right? It's just... All of the stuff we're doing with modeling is just trying to understand and hone in the best solution for that member. I mean, AI is just a better tool for us to get to that point. And in, in this case, it was it was a very specific texting solution, and it did kind of what you uh, a little bit what you alluded to. It would it would basically set up a whole string of champion challengers about time, language, all of that. And it's just a constant run where it then learns from itself for individual members and it and it hones in on the best time, the best way, and the best messaging in order to get to that dependent variable of whether it's whether it's helping the member with their situation or, or getting a payment or whatever it is. So one of my favorite topics on which one of yours, buy now, pay later. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So so explosive growth, right? Major concerns, right? You know, does the consumer really understand as they go from site to site and start making these great payments? There was a great comment that was made by one of the founders of one of these buy now, pay later companies. He said, you know, credit cards are a great way to pay, but they're a horrible way to pay back. And, you know, BNPL is a great way to pay and also a great way to pay back. Except who the hell remembers, right? All the different things I purchased. And now there's a bunch of startups being funded to help you pull together, right? all the different BNPL, you know, orders you put in so you can keep track of them. But it, up until now, there hasn't been. How much of this is a concern to you that, you know, and there's also concerns that all being reported to the bureaus correctly. So are you seeing this affecting your members and affecting their credit and affecting uh, their impact, impacting their ability to pay? Uh, so you touched on it. I mean, my biggest concern is the transparency into it, right? 
and we just you, you alluded to the transparency of the member just the, the the breadth of what they have taken on right and how it's scattered and, and it's not layered together and, and maybe that overwhelms them but for the financial institution the broad credit union we don't have the transparency into a lot of this right some of the longer term kind of uh you know three month 12 month version of the buy now pay later you maybe see, but the vast majority of the chunk of those paid boards, we don't see them. And, and that's where a lot of the, the, the action is happening. Um, so I, I do have a concern. Now, is it impacting us? Hard to say without the transparency, right? One of the reasons that we evaluated it and we wanted to, if it was a, it was a really good service for a member who wanted to participate and figure out a way to to offer it to our membership. What we found was that a vast majority of our members that we saw were participating already through Klarna or an afterpay already had a card, had exhausted their open to buy, and then they go. That is a real, real concern. So it's more about the underwriting and risk management on that side and what they're doing, right? Um, so so all that to say, we do have concerns, but the biggest thing is transparency into it. And I really hope, I thought there was a push from the regulators for, for some of these folks to start reporting. And I haven't, I haven't seen it happen. Yeah, I think there is. And I also think some of these other companies that are trying to aggregate up all of these um, out for the consumer are inadvertently going to be able to do that, right? Because uh, they'll be collecting it. Now the consumer is going to see it the same way they see, right, what their open lines are. Uh, and I think the consumer is going to start to see it, right? Because that's the challenge. The consumer can't even self-regulate because they're losing track. But uh, okay. interesting. So, look, we talked about your untapped markets. Certainly veterans, big for you. You're adding about a million members a month. But last question. So where do you see the growth for credit unions over the next sort of three to, to four years? Where do you see big growth, growth opportunities for the industry? Um, so going into 2024 and beyond for Navy federal, there's, there's a lot of growth opportunity. I think I mentioned earlier about some of our expanded field membership where they're relatively new to Navy federal eligibility. So there's certainly opportunity for us, but question, you know, credit unions as a whole and, uh, the area opportunity for growth there. Um, I, I think it's Gen Z, um, and what we found with Gen Z in particular, obviously they're kind of in that stage, that life stage where there's a growing need for financial institutions and, and the services they provide. But in particular, what we're finding with Gen Z is that um, more than other generations, they're making decisions based on company values and you know how they serve the community. And it's a particular opportunity for credit unions because that's in our DNA, right? Uh, we're, we've always been there for the member, the membership. Uh, and, and supporting the community and for us in particular, the military community. So I think we align very well with Gen Z. So as long as we kind of double down on that, we continue what we've been doing, you know, over, you know, this 80, 90 years for Navy Federal in particular, I think we have a great opportunity to, to capture that Gen Z generation over the next few years. Yeah, we certainly saw this with SVB, right? And, and the crisis. And, and I think a lot of, uh, of different leaders in the credit industry agree with you, right? It's about trust and, and making sh certain that members and people who haven't found credit unions yet understand that trust factor. So I, I agree. It's a very, very solid point, Brian. Well, listen, that's all the time you had. I do appreciate it. This was great. I appreciate you sharing your insights. Thanks for our listeners for tuning in. Make sure to subscribe so you can enjoy future episodes. And I will meet you back here for our next 22 Minutes in Lending. Thank you so much.